Hello everyone, my name is Philip and I am here with an important video today. Through the development of my RTS project, I have come around some structure issues that were quite hard to figure out as I couldn't brainstorm solutions working with Guido. So on this video, I'm going to share with you how I apply three important principles that allowed my project to be built as I wanted. So what I'm going to present here took quite a while to figure out and establish having started from scratch. Hopefully you won't have the same issues as I had. And we're going to be talking about modularity, attributes, and behaviors. So these are the principles we're going to be applying in Guido. Why and how they relate to each other. So first, let me just warn you, if you're a beginner in Guido and you're watching this tutorial, you may find it a little hard to understand. Don't be discouraged, but still, watch it to see if you can make sense of some of the things I'm going to talk about here. It may as well just help you in with the, your further development inside of Guido. So let's start with the first principle here, code modularity. My goal, which is to create complex or specific functions and to reuse them inside other objects or scripts. That's the idea with code modularity. So Godot by itself doesn't support multiple inheritance from classes, which might be the route you could go on to solve this issue. But you will only be able to extend linearly, meaning you can extend or inherit in multiple classes at the same time. However, our project as an RTS needs to manage complex specific operations with objects at any given point, which could be easily constructed with a bunch of decoupled functions to be used under our objects. So this was an important obstacle early on to overcome in my project. Here's an example you can see that when building many different units, we can split some behaviors into common patterns. So sometimes they repeat itself for different units which we want to avoid having to code repeatedly or, worse yet, unique for each one of them. Our solution then is to reuse scripts, is to make them work as a static function storage scripts. Extending from the lightest class possible, which is ref counted, we can establish the behavior or actions as we need and work with them as a resource, not as an object. This allows us to code functions once and reuse them anywhere we want. The only rule here is to not treat them as objects, meaning they will not store any variables inside. Everything has to be passed as an argument or be built inside the functions through a base reference like the object using the scripts. So you can pass the reference of the object that called the scripts and through the function inside of the script, you can access the other things related to the object, assuming you have built that structure inside the object. So this also helps you into organizing your project as you can categorize these scripts by function, action, or behavior as you see fit. Godot has addressed that this is a very common issue that many users have. The main solution for this is still being developed as of today. Through the Godot proposals in GitHub number 6416, you can see that they are still working on this. A link will be on the description of this video if you want to check out the details. So the official solution for this is being called trait system and will be much better than the module system we talked about because it will have a lot more features such as auto completion which will automatically detect errors helping you to debug and maintain your code. But sadly as we can see here this feature isn't planned for 4.3 but could be implemented in a future release. So no pressure, this is not a core issue, it's a common issue that many people have but it's a quality of life improvement and something is going to help a lot Godot, but it's not something that's going to break Godot if it doesn't have it. So I can see why it doesn't have the main priority, but as many developers, we always like these new features that is going to allow us to do much more things. So we are highly anticipating this when it lands in Godot. But let's say you want a solution for this problem right now. This is one of the ways you can reuse scripts in Godot. So this is the main idea with code modularity as a principle, is to build static scripts, that is going to be loaded and be treated as resources by other objects to execute actions, functions, or behavior, passing any variables as arguments to those functions. So this is going to allow you to build isolate code blocks and to reuse them anywhere, anytime. This has some trade-offs, which I'm going to talk about near the end of the video once we'll be recapping everything back together. But this is the main principle, which is going to be the foundation for the other building blocks as I'm going to be talking about. So the next one, which is object attributes. So we want object attributes to be easily editable, allowing us to create many different units, buildings, or objects for the game. 
As we have discussed in other videos, some attributes are static information and we don't want to edit them. This means that we can use a static data library, which I have decided to work with as a CSV file for ease management. But here you can use any other file or format to structure and organize this type of data, just as JSON or even XML. So the solution then is to store these attributes under an object inside a variable, so we can easily access and work with. And we can also later process this data a little further to refine it after we have imported it. So not necessarily the way we import this data from the CSV, it's the final representation inside the object. We can also change it later through functions inside the game. And we also have to worry about things like dynamic attributes, things like HP, faction, and some other attributes that we are bound to change at any time during gameplay. So this is going to set us a template for objects to fill in through the CSV data, which you can also add it through the spreadsheet and load them inside the variable to work with later. Through the functions, we can also refine this data and process to more complex things as we see fit. Just like in the case of dynamic attributes, we don't need to specify them inside of the CSV data, but however, we need them inside of objects. So we can do this later with functions inside of those objects, not necessarily having to load everything from the CSV file. And here's an example of what that might look like inside the CSV format in a spreadsheet editor. We have each property exposed and ready for us to analyze and edit at any given time. So the next principle we're going to be talking about is going to be the result of combining the first two ones. The goal of this principle is to have complex, unique behaviors for objects. Through the combination of modular coding and object attributes, we can emulate then the behaviors we need. So the idea then is to avoid having to code everything as unique per object type, but instead to rely on, all, on the structures we build with attributes and modular scripts in order to have these unique behaviors. So, how we apply these principles in our RTS project? Let's assume we want through modularity to be combined with object attributes to customize the object behavior. Let's say we want some RTS game objects such as units, building, or resources. And let's establish some attributes and say that some objects can do any of these actions or behaviors. They will be combined to allow one of these objects to be built fairly easily. The key here is thinking how can you isolate a behavior in a system that you can reapply for other objects without conflicts if possible. That is the biggest issue you have with modular coding. So our first big problem is how we actually customize units with modular code to create unique objects. How can you put this through code with GD script? Through the object attributes we will define in the data for the game, we will have access to different module scripts which will allow us to access into different functions that will make then finally these objects unique from each other. Okay, so let's start again. That got a little bit complex. We want a soldier, a healer and a worker. Let's make a script for each one of them, right? Because they are different after all. Actually, they are not. Let's say all of these are units. Let's put them in the top here. Now let's pass some attributes for each one of them as dictionary pages. Later we can call the RTS unit code check if they have a specific attribute in order to execute a specific function from a script. In this case, we can use a module which is a script outside of the RTS unit script that does what we want. In the case of our attacker unit, it can only attack if it has an attribute attacker. The attack functions come outside of the unit script so can also use it with buildings or other object types. This already works, but once your project starts to grow, a problem may arise. Checking for attributes this way can be somewhat expensive as the list of attributes grows. But can we have a better method or a better way to know which attributes belong to what objects? So let's change somewhat our approach to this problem and instead of checking if they exist inside an object, let's check if they are true or not. Meaning we don't care about any of the other attributes, we just want to know if these specific ones are true or false. But how do you do that? At first you may think that checking attributes, methods and variables is the answer to this. The main advantage to this method is that they are very fast to prototype and code, and they are very simple to understand. If a variable is present inside an object or if they have an, a specific method, then we know we can do XYZ later. 
The disadvantage, however, from these methods is that they are based on stringy processing, meaning they have no autocomplete features or error detection. It doesn't know you misspelled something and will not report as an error. It will only say that the object doesn't have PH when you mistyped HP. So this can lead to messy coding, which is hard to maintain. And when you are refactoring, you have to take care of these unique references. So because they are strings, this also means they have to be processed by each character at a time, meaning they are a little slower to check and use. So if we don't want to use any of these methods, how can we verify an object variable without checking if they have the specific variables or methods? Let's think about object attributes as flags now. If an object is X, then we can do X things, like a boolean check to execute some code. So we can, instead of does this object can heal, we can say it is a healer. We can make these as a dictionary pages. So then we do have string reference saying if they have or not a given attribute. But let's say we work with just an array of booleans instead. This is less readable, but much faster to execute and lightweight because it's simpler. So instead of checking if an object has a var or a method using strings, we can simply check if an attribute is true or not. The attacker and healer down here can be in simple enumerations. Meaning we are now working with boolean checks, much simpler. So by defining attributes as enumeration or enums, the order of these attributes will determine which attributes they are in the array index. For instance, here by defining healer the first attribute, we know at the index 0 or the position 0 of the attributes array of a given object, we are saying that they are a healer or not. So the order of the booleans inside the array variable will represent which attribute is true or not. So then we can say if an object attributes healer is true, then allow our object to heal others. But how can we make sure that a object will have an X attribute? Because if a var or entry doesn't exist, it will crash the project. We're going to determine a rule here for development of attributes that every RTS game object will have them. This means that any smart object like units, building or resources in our project will have every attribute listed and if they are true or false. This way we can safely check for them at any time blazingly fast because they are going to be just a boolean variable in an array position without having to check if they have or not that given attribute. So as a warning, you the developer are responsible to make sure that these objects will have the attributes set correctly. Provided we initialize them from a separate script module, this is fairly easy to not miss and keep track of, which is a perfect candidate for a script module just like we talked about on our first principle. So back to our example in building the RTS objects, let's see how can we apply them. We want units, so let's change them to use a RTS unit script. And let's pass attributes we want. Because we want to work with flags instead of string attributes, this will work better in an array. So let's switch the attributes to that. Remember, the only rule here is to have listed all attributes for all objects. Next, we want to check if an object has a given attribute. Because we have determined a rule for them on our developer side of things, we know they exist and we can check them if they are true instead. And finally, call the appropriate function for that specific object. As you can see, the attributes index will determine which attribute it is. These attributes can also be set through the CSV file format as you see here. They by default are all set to false and the only ones we pass on here on the spreadsheet on the CSV file will be turned to true upon being imported to the game. This of course can be adapted to your file format just as easy. It's just an idea. Now let's talk about applying these attributes in a AI code where things can get a little more complicated. Here you can see that we could update the AI of object in different ways. First by allowing our RTS world object to contact any object and call for a emit event function. Our objects then can execute special code for that given signal. Note that this signal is not a string one, but an integer value is passed instead. And this is just a readable as a common signal in Godot, it's just a different way of doing it. Then objects will check which event has passed through them. 
and they can then execute a check for a given attribute in order to check a specific action. In this case, the goal is to scan for anime units only for objects that have an attacker attribute in the case of units, or in the case of buildings, if they have a ranged attack attribute. And as you can see, both objects are using all our principles here. As an example, the unit has loaded the script module attacker and now is able to call its functions here. That is how you can use the idea of modular codes with static scripts, just like I told on the first principle. Just as the same, our building object is able to call the same function without having any relation to the unit, provided you also load the script inside of it. And it is also directly accessing the same function. This is the basis of script modules I have so extensively talked about and tried to build. But let's say we want to make things a little even modular. Let's say instead that our units will not care what attributes they have, but instead they will call a function that will automatically process any attributes they have listed. This means we first check which event was passed on to us, which attributes we have in our object data, and we finally execute that behavior. This function run attribute 4 can even be for another modular if we wanted, a module of attributes responsible for behaviors. As you can see, using these concepts, you can pretty much call scripts for any place, anywhere, fairly easily, leaving you to determine if you want to make a function unique or share it between objects. And that is a very important decision when you are making bigger and complex projects. Here are also other examples of mixing modules together. Any module can access other modules and call for functions. Because they are not objects, only static functions in scripts. We treat them as resources and we can use them as we want. So let's now recap and see how everything ties together. So the first principle is the basis of everything. It allows you to build scripts that will store behaviors for objects or things you want a object to do. And these scripts will allow you to reuse the code inside of them, but they have a big limitation. And this is where I have to also talk about, which is why the trait system will be much better than this. They cannot validate if an object is adequate to use these scripts, meaning we don't know if an object has all the vars and methods called from these static scripts. And we also don't want to be checking for them. So there's no automatic error detection. This means that will be solely your responsibility of making sure these objects will meet the requirements of the scripts they are using, which has potential for bugs to happen only at runtime, not when you are coding it. And this may seem a little simple and you could say, oh, but that is no issue, but this is very relevant. So at this very moment, this is one of the few ways we can work around that good old single class inheritance limitation to have reusable code, at least until traits arrive. But even when traits will become available, this system that I described with modular scripts will still work and be faster to use. So in my opinion, this is very important system to use for your games inside of Gideo. Next, talk okay, about the object attributes. Because our project needed a lot of specialized behaviors, by considering them as attributes, it's fairly easy to just select which ones each object will have. In the case of the RTS, some object attributes do not change, and they are stored as vars inside a static data library, things like HP, damage, armor, etc. So, otherwise, AI attributes like behaviors we want to simulate can be easily stored in an array of booleans, almost working like a flag system for each unit. With this, we have achieved our third principle. We have now an inventory of options to design our objects with freedom, without having to rely on unique scripts per object, just by using the same structure with different attributes. As your game expands, the code that supports this entire system will need to be maintained. And you can add other attributes and behavior very easily with this idea. The structure for the system might seem hard at first to implement, but it has the structure needed to support this type of game. And if you follow these principles, it can work together to then build your own games with unique objects. So this is how I am building my RTS project for now. And having explained in detail, I think you can find other ways to use it in other projects just as well.